Good morning and good afternoon to all hepatologists and colleagues in Asia. Firstly, I would like to thank the Asian Pacific Association for the Study of the Liver for inviting me to be a co-moderator of the Apuzzle webinar today, together with Professor Omat. Today's webinar is a special one. It is dedicated to Professor Roger Williams in a remembrance of his outstanding contributions to the specialty of liver diseases worldwide and specifically to hepatology in Asia. May I have the first slide, please? Professor Williams was one of the founders of modern hepatology and he championed excellence in hepatology for six decades. He has led the advances in almost every area of research, diagnosis and treatment of liver diseases. He was the pioneer who in 1966 set up the model of integrated liver unit at King's, bringing under one roof clinicians, pathologists, and scientists in close collaboration with surgeons and pediatricians to move hepatology forward. Uniquely, Professor Williams created three liver institutes, firstly at King's in 1966, at University College London in 1996, and back at King's in 2016, all three are rising from the ground to become leading international liver centers. Roger was a founder, a pioneer, and a mentor. He teamed up with Professor Roy Kahn to set up the Cambridge King's Transplant Program, and in 1968, they carried out the first liver transplantation in Europe. Many more liver transplantations followed afterwards, and Roger Williams is the founding father of transplant hepatology. Under Roger Williams' leadership, multidisciplinary teams from the three liver institutes produced many landmark publications which shaped our understanding and management of liver diseases in acute liver failure, liver transplantation, autoimmune hepatitis, viral hepatitis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and many others. Most importantly, the three institutes of Roger Williams provided foundations for international collaboration and training in hepatology by bringing together more than 600 clinicians and scientists from across the UK and all over the world. They then went on to disseminate the knowledge and passion to tackle liver diseases and carried with pride the badge of old boys and girls from Roger Williams Institute. Next slide, please. This photo of Roger Williams and I was taken during a puzzle annual meeting in Shanghai 2017. I have been associated with Roger for almost 40 years, since 1981. I have had the privilege to know him and to work with him through the highs and lows of all three institutes for liver diseases. When I took my first Wellcome Trust Research Fellowship at the Liver Unit at King's in 1981, it was only six months after I started when Roger asked whether I had completed my first paper. How very typical of Roger that was. My initial attachment was followed by two further Wellcome Trust Research Fellowships at King's, then Professor of Hepatology at University College London, and for the last 10 years, I served as scientific advisor to the Foundation for Liver Research and the Institute of Hepatology. Next slide, please. Back at King's, the Golden Jubilee in 2016 marked 50 years of liver research, which was a triumph for Roger and a memorable celebration for the family of old boys and girls from all three institutes that you can see here on this uh, photo. Next slide, please. 
Contributions of Roger Williams to hepatology in Asia are best illustrated by the number of fellows who trained and worked at King's and at University College London from so many countries across Asia. In this slide, I have assembled the photos and names, and as you can see, these include many of the most prominent hepatologists in Asia and globally. Our two speakers today, George Lau and Ed Gain, Masashi Mitsukami, Jin Lin Ho, Timi Piratvisu, Antonio Bertoletti, Samir Shah, and many others. Leading experts like Professor Sarin and Professor Sengi Lim participated in the postgraduate liver programs at King's. My sincere apologies to those fellows for whom I could not find the photo and are shown here only by name, and also to those who perhaps I may have missed. Roger Williams was a remarkable person who made a difference to the life of many patients and doctors worldwide. His unparalleled legacy will live on, carried further by those who he trained and inspired to bring benefit to patients with liver diseases. Next slide, please. I'm now very pleased to introduce Mrs. Stephanie Williams, who would like to address the Asian Pacific Association for the Study of the Liver. Mrs. Williams. I am very grateful to the Asian Pacific Liver Association for dedicating this webinar to Professor Roger Williams. Roger very much enjoyed interacting with hepatologists from Asia and participated in many of the annual meetings of the Asian Pacific Association. I was fortunate to accompany him on many of these meetings and to enjoy your great hospitality and I was always delighted to see again so many of the fellows, his old boys, who've been through the institutes at King's and University College London. Roger worked tirelessly and I mean tirelessly almost to the exclusion of everything else to advancing hepatology on all fronts around the world. He will be very proud of his old boys and I am happy that you are now continuing his passion and work. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Ed Gain. Dr. Gain is Professor of Medicine at the University of Auckland and Chief Hepatologist at the New Zealand Liver Transplant Unit. Ed was amongst the hardest working fellows in the liver unit at King's. Usually one can see him late in the evening cutting liver biopsies or aliquoting serum samples from patients. He produced outstanding papers and I'd like to highlight the New England Journal of Medicine paper published in 1996 on long-term outcome of HCV infection after liver transplantation, which has more than 1,100 citations to date. More recently, Ed has been associated with the most significant advances in hepatitis B and hepatitis C treatment. In 2011, Ed Gain was awarded member of the Order of New Zealand for Services to Medicine. Ed, over to you. Look forward to hearing your presentation. And thank you, Nikolai, for your introduction and the wonderful words uh, for Professor Roger Williams. It is truly an honor for me today to be giving this uh, le lecture at this symposium in memory of Roger. And in particular, talking on a topic which was dear to Roger's heart, and that was liver transplantation for chronic viral hepatitis. These are my disclosures. Back in the uh, early 90s, uh, as a 
just finished my training, I started to work uh, with senior colleagues uh, with injecting drug users for non A, non B hepatitis. Hepatitis C was discovered. And we quickly saw the increase in disease burden from hepatitis C uh, in New Zealand as across the world, uh, as shown here by the increases in liver cancer and liver transplant. And Asia Pacific did not escape. A third of all uh, people living today with hepatitis C live in the Asia Pacific region. So I was sent to the UK to train in transplant medicine and I arrived at King's College where Nikolai took me under his wing and Roger called me into his office and he said to me, Ed, you're going to have a look at all our transplants and see how many of them actually had hepatitis C, but of course <clears throat> we weren't able to test. And that led to this uh, uh, seminal paper, uh, which I must pay tribute not only to uh, Nikolai, but Bernard and, and other members of the team, and of course, Professor Williams for his guidance. We looked at uh, almost a thousand liver transplant recipients from King's and arranged peered biopsies uh, at um, one and five years post-transplant and showed that uh, most non-A, non-B and cryptogenic cirrhotics actually had hepatitis C on PCR, and hepatitis C was associated with uh, rapid progression of liver disease after transplant, with 20% of patients having recurrent cirrhosis within five years. And that was associated with a reduction in outcomes compared to people being transplanted for other indications. And soon after, many other uh, groups and registries had shown that there was a real impact on survival after transplant in people with hepatitis C of course, from the recurrent infection. So there's interest to look how could we eradicate hepatitis C. And Marina Beringer, our colleague in Valencia, uh, she published widely on this. This is probably her best uh, known uh, publication, 160 patients with recurrent hepatitis C after transplant, of whom 89 were treated with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. Note the very low sustained virologic response rate, only 30%, as is typical in this population. And you can see there's no improvement in treatment if you uh, didn't achieve SVR, but if you achieved SVR, uh, your <clears throat> post-transplant outcomes return pretty much to normal for people without hepatitis C. But as I pointed out, it had a low rate of cure. And this is because all antiviral therapies at that stage were poorly effective uh, in liver transplant recipients. This is largely due to the effects of immunosuppression on viremia but also on the very poor tolerability of both ribavirin from the hemolysis and pegylated interferon from the cytopenias and from acute and chronic allograft rejection. Marina published data which showed more than 80% of people had to reduce treatment and about a third had to stop their treatment and never com uh, completed. So we needed, this was a huge unmet need given that hepatitis C was rapidly becoming the leading cause for transplant. But what a difference a decade made. And along came all oral direct acne antivirals. <clears throat> the first genotype one shown here had cure rates well above 90%. And then we arrived at the truly uh, uh, effective and safe pan genotypic regimens, uh, Gilead, Sofosbuvir, Valpatisvir, and Abvis, Glicaprovir, Pabrentisvir, with cure rates in non-transplant patients of between 98 and 99%. Extraordinary. And these were the three regimens which made such a difference after liver transplant. These are available throughout our region. There are many licensed generics for sofosbuvir lidipasvir and sofosbuvir velpatasvir now available in Asia Pacific. And we've learned uh, this year for the first time, we will also have generic lacaprovir pabrentasvir uh, available in some of the Asia Pacific countries. So we will have the state of the art treatments. So the question is, when should we treat people being transplanted for hepatitis C? And most of their uh, initial uh, uh, interest was in treating people who were living with recurrent hepatitis C, who had progressive disease. And so treating established disease after transplant. The safest drugs were the drugs I've mentioned, Harvoni, Eplus, and Maverick, because they had minimal drug-drug interactions. The drug interaction between Maverick or Glucaprovir and Cyclosporum was mild, and it didn't pertain to tacrolimus, which was safe to use without dose changing. And the results for the, uh, the clinical trials and liver transplant recipients I'll show now. 
This is Kosh Agarau's trial of uh, Eplusa, soft valpatazvir, uh, in people with recurrent uh, hepatitis C post-transplant. And you can see across the genotypes, very, very high cure rates. Similar results for glucaprovir and pibrentasvir with SVR or cure rates over 90% across the genotypes. So this is no longer an unmet medical need. As a result, most liver transplant centers around the world have eradicated recurrent hepatitis C in their liver transplant recipient population. And this has led to an increased post-transplant survival. This is data from the uh, multi-centered Spanish study. On the left, we show changes in outcomes over the last uh, uh, 10 years uh, in patients without hepatitis C. And there hasn't been a lot of increased uh, benefits in liver transplant recipients without hepatitis C. But on the right, you can see the dramatic increase in outcome survival after transplant for hepatitis C since the arrival of direct acting antivirals. The UNOS registry data is even more dramatic. No change in one year survival in people transplanted for other indications, but a rapid and steady increase in outcomes and improved survival in people transplanted for hepatitis C. And what these tell us is that since the introduction of DAAs, outcomes for transplant for hepatitis C are comparable to other indications for transplant. So if drugs are so good, if these are so much uh, the uh, ideal uh, cure for hepatitis C, can we treat people before transplant and even prevent recurrence, or even so, pr prevent the need for liver transplantation? Not all drugs can be used in people with decompensated cirrhosis, and we know that the protease inhibitors in particular uh, have increased exposure and heptotoxicity, so they cannot be used. So really the only combinations you can use in people with decompensated cirrhosis are sofosfavir and one of the NS5A uh, inhibitors. The seminal study were the solar studies where they used Harvoni, the Gilead combination of sofosfavir and lidibosvir plus ribavirin to treat people uh, on the waiting list with Charles Q, B and C cirrhosis. Note they use low dose ribavirin. And the results were very encouraging. 89% uh, SVR in Charles QB, 81% in Charles QC. It wasn't because the drugs didn't work as well in Charles QC, it's because people were dying from the underlying liver disease. And in fact, the antiviral activity is very similar, no matter what degree of decompensation. This waterfall plot shows that those patients treated in the solar studies, most of them had an improvement in their liver synthetic function, 74% had an improvement in the Charles Pew score by at least one point, and 61% had an improvement in the MELD score. So you were rescuing people's liver synthetic function. Could you rescue them from transplant? This European multi-center study published by Belly and updated recently is a very important study. They looked at 144 patients listed for decompensated hepatitis C. They were treated with sofosfavir-based regimens. Uh, and of those 44, just under a third of them de were deactivated from the waiting list because of clinical improvement. And you can see that it was the pre-treatment MELD score, which was the best predictor of whether people improved enough to come off the waiting list. The lower the MELD score, the higher the benefits in terms of improvement and recovery. What's more, in the follow-up paper, when they followed these people for another two years, they showed, and these uh, points show uh, the uh, Charles Pew scores uh, before treatment, at the time they were delisted 24 weeks post-treatment and two years later. And what you can see is that people continue to improve. They didn't stop improving once they achieved SVR. <clears throat> Four were relisted. And I should point out, this is a very important point. The people who are relisted for decompensation all had intractable ascites throughout the course during treatment and thereafter. And one patient developed HGC and was relisted for this. If you look at all the data from Gilead on treating decompensated patients, it's important to note if you look at the orange bars, although the numbers of Charles Bucy's uh, decline, a significant number of people do not improve. They remain Charles Bucy, and these are the patients with a severe portal hypertension before treatment, the ones with ascites and encephalopathy. And these patients may be cured, but they have a poor quality of life. They lose their transplant priority, in particular in the United States, because of the MELD score drops. 
and in fact they had no improvement in, tr in transplant free survival. This is the term coined in the US as malpurgatory. So people get cured on the waiting list, but they remain too sick to be delisted, but they wait longer. Can you choose who should be treated on the waiting list? And the different uh, transplant organizations in ESL have looked at this, and they all suggest that, and although they differ slightly, most people accept if the meld is less than 20, it's a green light, go ahead and treat all of these people. You have a good chance of getting them off the waiting list. Amber, uh, 16 to 20, somewhere in between, uh, you probably should treat them if they don't have severe portal hypertension for the reasons I showed. The red uh, zone, the patients with a very high MELD score, <coughs> these patients are better uh, to wait, get transplanted, and get treated post-liver transplant. Uh, there's a very good scoring system which is available online for all uh, transplant physicians to use, a very simple way to determine the chances of uh, recovery of liver function on the waiting list. It's called the BE3 score, and it's available uh, on uh, MD Calc, etc. And it's a very good guide to whom will improve and should get delisted after treatment. This data is fresh off the press. It's, it's, uh, pub pub it's uh, published uh, online. And this is from Rob Wong, uh, the group, the UNOS group. And I'll just show you, this is waiting list registrants, people being put on the waiting list for various indications. And look at what's happened since 2014 when DAAs became widely available. There has been a 58% reduction in listing for hepatitis C overall. It's greatest in the decompensated patients. Two thirds of patients with decompensated cirrhosis reduction in being listed for liver transplant. We thought the changes in the hepatocellular carcinoma would be much, much later. But in fact, the change is also dramatic for patients being listed for hepatocellular carcinoma. There's been a 48% reduction in numbers being listed for HEC over the last five years. So this is the US where they've had DAAs possibly before anyone else. I've got data from uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand and our combined registry data. We lag a wee bit behind. We were much slower in getting certainly the pangenotypic regimens. But you can see that even in Australia and New Zealand, there's been 50% reduction in decompensated uh, cirrhosis transplants and already the numbers of hepatomas have plateaued and are falling steadily. 12% drop in the last two years. So this will be a worldwide phenomenon. What about hepatitis B? And I should start off by saying hepatitis B, Asia Pacific has made the biggest contributions to the advancement of transplantation for this indication. And that reflects a much higher uh, burden of hepatitis B, of course, in our region. And the numbers are climbing uh, dramatically, in particular with the uh, uh, uptake of transplantation in China and many other Asian countries. Uh, this year, we expect more than 10,000 liver transplants in the Asian region. And of course, the majority of them are for hepatitis B. It wasn't so long ago that hepatitis B was considered a contraindication for transplant. And this is because we know HPV has a steroid uh, uh, st stimulated a steroid enhanced uh, element which leads to increased viral replication and immunosuppression leads to rapid uh, liver disease, cytopathic liver disease, what we call uh, fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis, leading to graft failure and death early post transplant. And in the early 1980s, outcomes for transplant for hepatitis B were the worst for any elective indication for transplant. So much so that the NIH symposium. Uh, suggested that HPV should never be considered an indication for liver transplantation and should only be experimental protocols. Well, uh, certainly the European group, Eurohep under DA Samuel, published the first uh, advance, which was, of course, the use of intravenous immunoglobulin at the time of liver transplant and long term post transplant to prevent recurrence in the graft. Subsequently, the Americans used high dose. And then high dose plus lamivudine when it became available <coughs> and showed that they could reduce the recurrence rate from 90% to less than 10%. But note the costs there shown there in uh, crimson. This cost per annum is just not affordable in any centers in the Asia Pacific region. So we had to look at strategies to reduce the cost of hepatitis B immunoglobulin. The first was HBIG dose reduction and this was by uh, necessity 
uh, in Australia and New Zealand where we didn't have access to intravenous HPEG. So we used low-dose intramuscular hepatitis B immunoglobulin manufactured in Australia. We used it uh, daily for one week uh, post-transplant and then monthly long-term, and we combined it with lamivudine. And the results published in gastroenterology showed excellent results, less than 5% recurrence of hepatitis B in this uh, large cohort of patients, who have now been followed up for over eight years. What about withdrawal? There was a lot of uh, interest in withdrawal and, and the chairman was involved in such studies. I'll just switch to the study done in Australia and New Zealand, where we switched patients in that initial protocol to, from lamivudine plus HBIG to lamivudine plus adefavir. These were the only two uh, nukes we had available when we designed the study. <clears throat> and the results, although numbers were small, were excellent with uh, uh, only one patient developing recurrent hepatitis B uh, if they were switched at one year. The, nat the natural uh, progression was to go to uh, hepatitis B immunoglobulin avoidance and to use all oral therapy. And this was driven by the work by James Fong and the team at Queen Mary in Hong Kong. And this is a very instructive um, uh, uh, study. Uh, you can see this is their protocol now. They use integravir from the time of uh, transplant long-term, and the outcomes are tremendous, 85% long-term survival and 97% hepatitis B surface antigen-free. In New Zealand, we uh, had early access to tenofovir, so we uh, took on board the Hong Kong data and went to tenofovir monotherapy. And we have had over 100 patients this, uh, in this protocol. It's not a study. Uh, of those, 86 have been transplanted to date. We do give HPIG if we don't know the HPV DNA level, and I'll explain why in a minute. And these are for most of our acute on chronics. Get HPIG for one week, IM, that's all. But the rest, the vast majority, 83%, received no HPIG. They received tenofovir from the time of listing. So we started it early. And we have had no recurrences in 71 patients who have been transplanted on tenofovir monotherapy. And this is the data we have, that 100% of patients are surface antigen uh, free uh, by three months, with a medium time to surface antigen loss of only two weeks. That's very different from the Hong Kong data, which took eight weeks uh, for median time to loss. And the reason for that is clear. Uh, in our uh, particular cohort, almost all patients were already on nukes when they were referred to for transplant. They were all on tenofovir established at the time of transplant. Very few had quantifiable HPV DNA at the time of transplant. If you compare that to Hong Kong, because of necessity, uh, only half the patients were actually on nukes when they came in for transplant, although they all started in Tikavir then. So uh, over a quarter of patients had high HPV DNA levels at transplant. And the median DNA in the New Zealand cohort is significantly lower than the Hong Kong cohort. And that explains the difference. I should point out though, that at the end of the day, at the end of the year or two years, there's really no difference between the two. And James Fong went back, he looked at this data, uh, and James went back and looked at the Hong Kong data and showed just that. It was the HPV DNA level at transplant, which determined how quickly you lost surface antigen post-transplant. And that's driven them really to use and take care earlier, try and get people well established and suppressed before they uh, get transplanted. Are there any recent developments for hepatitis B transplantation? Well, I think we have to look at the new nuke, that's tenofovir, tenofovir alafenamide. This is the uh, safe, uh, better tolerated liver targeting tenofovir ester brought up from Gilead. This is a Gilead study. We performed at our unit only 51 patients Long-term transplant recipients were randomized to continue to nofovir, which was our protocol, or to switch to TAF. And we wanted to see what difference that made in terms of uh, renal benefits and bone benefits, given what we've seen from the TAF studies in non-transplant patients. Well tolerated, uh, no biologic relapse. The only AEs we saw in this study were those related to transplantation. And even more uh, significant than seen in non-transplant patients because transplant patients are at risk for renal disease, they are at risk for bone disease. We saw significant improvements in terms of EGFR when we switched patients from tenofovir to TAF, and we saw significant improvements in bone mineral density, both head and spine, in the patients who switched from tenofovir to TAF. So this really tells us, whoops, 
that um, TAF is safe and well tolerated, and certainly it does have benefits in this very high risk patient population in terms of renal function and bone density. And I think this should be considered as the preferred treatment post liver transplant. So what a difference two decades had made for hepatitis B. If you look at the outcomes back in the 80s, they were abysmal, even in the Australia New Zealand registry. And now the outcomes for liver transplantation for hepatitis B in the Australia New Zealand registry are the best amongst all adult uh, indications. So Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, oral antiviral therapies, nukes for hepatitis B and DAAs for hepatitis C are safe and effective both before and after liver transplantation. Established recurrent viral infection can be treated with post-transplant antiviral therapy, and this prevents allograft failure. We can now treat patients uh, before or at the time of transplant to prevent recurrent hepatitis B and C infection. And these prophylaxis and treatment uh, protocols have improved long-term outcomes after transplant for patients with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Most patients with decompensated hepatitis B and C can now be rescued from the need for transplant by treating them in a timely fashion with nukes and direct acting antivirals. And liver transplantation for both hepatitis B and C related liver cancer is expected to decline over the next decade. So what will be the next challenge for liver transplantation in Asia. If I look at our data over the 20 years of the New Zealand Liver Transplant Unit, when we started, we were very much a hepatitis B unit. That was by far the single uh, biggest indication for transplant. Along came entecavir and then adefavir. Sped up 10 years and hepatitis C had become our primary indication, accounting for 50% of adult liver transplants. And then along came the direct acting antivirals. And what we're seeing now is increasing numbers of transplants, but they're now due not to hepatitis B and hepatitis C, but to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And Asia will not escape this uh, tsunami of obesity. This is uh, data from the Chinese National Survey looking at uh, uh, children and uh, adolescents, looking at the rates of overweight and obesity in males and females, and you can see the dramatic increase over the last 15, 20, sorry, last 25 years due uh, to changes in diet and more sedentary uh, occupations. In China alone, there are 30 million children who are obese. And this will translate to a huge demand for liver transplantation. So I'd like to finish there. I'd like to thank you for all your attention. But I'd also like to finish by thanking Roger Williams. Roger, to me, was a teacher, a mentor, and a friend. And he is, and he was, a true giant in hepatology and transplant medicine. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gain. I'm the Dr. Mada from Tokyo, and I I'm really appreciate I can be one of the member to be a tribute to the late Roger Williams. So the second topic I have to introduce is uh, George Lau. He graduated University of Hong Kong in 1987, and he became a member he uh, was an MRCP member from the Royal College of Physicians. And then the late Roger Williams recommended further training at the Translational Hepatology at the University of College in London on adaptive immunology, which he will address today. And he awarded uh, most, most outstanding out out youth in Hong Kong in 2002. After that, he was appointed as a clinical professor of University of Hong Kong University. He was a president from the period 2008 to 2009 as the 19th uh, president of APASO. And he is currently a life member of the steering committee of APASO. And 
he published more than 300 full papers in hepatology, including New England Journal and Lancet, and the current H index uh, is 84. And today, he may talk and address the HBV reactivation and uh, the uh, research in the past three decades. Uh, Dr. Jojo, please. Thank you, Professor Omata, for the kind introductions. It is really my honor to give a talk at this um, lecture so for the Professor Roger Williams, especially in this difficult COVID-19 pandemic difficult time. The topic assigned to me is HPV reactivations research in the past three decades. I'm George Lau, working in China. My path crossed with Prof. Williams more than 20 years ago with his major interest in acute or chronic liver failures or acute liver failure. In Asia Pacific regions, such as the Far East, the cause of acute liver failure is very different from the Western populations. As illustrated in this article, invited by the Prof. Williams to me, uh, published in the Seminar of Liver Diseases which shows that hepatitis B reactivations is the major cause of acute liver failure in, in the Far East, such as Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, and India. For the past 30 years, numerous clinical research has been conducted to understand the incidence and risk factors, the pathogenesis, the standardizations of nomenclatures, and also clinical trials to understand how we can tackle with the problems of hepatitis due to HPV reactivations. Around 30 years ago, in Queen Mary hospitals, when Anna Locke is still with us, she conducted the first prospective studies in a group of patients, Chinese, treated in Queen Mary hospitals with lymphomas who received cytotoxic chemotherapy. It was clearly demonstrated that those patients who are service antigen positive will run a much higher risk of hepatitis, some of them with etiolic hepatitis, due to HPV reactivations. Subsequently, also in our centers, with the initiations of the bone marrow transplant programs, we showed that hepatitis due to HPV reactivations in patients who are service antigen positives with hematological malignancy undergoing bone marrow transplantations run a much higher risk of hepatitis due to HPV reactivations. And as illustrated in these figures, fatalities can result from fulminant hepatic failure. The pathogenesis of hepatitis due to HPV reactivations in patients treated with immunosuppressive therapies was carefully understood based on the prospectively collected serial samples uh, with our understandings of the HPV markers and ALT the biochemistries. It could be divided into two phases. In the initial phase, when the immunosuppressive therapy, such as the cytotoxic chemotherapy for the treatments of leukemia or immunosuppressive therapy for marrow ablations and bone marrow transplantations, there is an enhance of HPV replications and expressions as evidenced by the elevations of HPV DNA levels in the serum. With the withdrawals of these immunosuppressive therapies, and there is a re institution of the, the immune response to the HPV-laden hepatocytes, resulting in liver dam damages, as manifested by the elevations of the serum ALT levels. And sometimes the liver damages also can result in acute hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, hepatic failures, or even death. Apart from those patients uh, with hematological malignancies uh, or the, who requires a uh, hemopoietic stem cell therapy, uh, as it can have uh, uh, hepatitis due to HPV reactivations, those patients with solid tumors treated with oncological therapies, rheumatological diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases, and autoimmune diseases treated with disease modifiers uh, has also been recently shown so, and so, as to be at risk of to have hepatitis due to HPV reactivations. 
How about the incidence and risk factors for hepatitis due to HPV reactivations? The incidence is poorly understood and because of the poor definitions due to the lack of standardizations of the nomenclatures and the definitions, and most of those studies are retrospective, incomplete characterizations of baselines, HPV status, and with inconsistent follow-up. Most of the definitions for HPV reactivations is based on hepatitis to be present with an ALT greater than threefold increase or greater than 100 international units, and to be related to reactivations of hepatitis B if it is preceded or accompanied by a one lock increase in HPV DNA levels, zero HPV DNA turns from negative to positive, or surface antigen negative to positive levels. In the recent uh, five to 10 years, uh, a lot of disease modifying agents with immunological activities has been shown to be related to hepatitis due to HPV reactivations. This includes TNF alpha inhibitors such as the infliximate, agents targeting B cells such as rutisimate and with NTCD20 activities, and agents targeting T cell activations and direct T cells inhibitions and agents targeting T cell migrations and chemostasis. These patients run a high risk of HPV reactivations and can result in hepatitis or even fulminant hepatic failure. There are other agents with less impact on the HPV reactivations and these include those uh, directing the uh, T cell inhibitions and such as T cell migrations or chemostasis, uh, such as those with alpha-4 integrins, uh, interleukin inhibitors, Tyrosine kinase inhibitors are used for the treatments of malignancies, and also the EGFR inhibitors are targeted therapies for other oncological patients. Targeting jack stat signaling and complementary pathways inhibitors has also been shown to be related to HPV reactivations. There are other immune modulatory agents being used and has been shown to be related to HPV reactivations, but at a much lower risk. But we have to bear in mind this can happen, especially so with the uh, utilizations and uh, of widespread use of immune checkpoint therapies, such as those patients with hepatocellular carcinomas. One needs to bear in mind of the possibility of HPV reactivations to be related with the use of these therapies. We are the first groups to demonstrate some years ago the possibilities of HPV reactivations even in those patients who are surface energy negative but has previous infections or has recovered from past infections of hepatitis B infections. In those patients treated with retusimate and anti-CD20 agents which deplete the B cells and therefore removing the neutralizing antibodies against the hepatitis B virus and can result in fulminant hepatic failure. In the era of a chronic hepatitis C with the development of a panorals, direct acting antiviral agents, PR therapies is now almost obsolete. Indeed, the current recommendations for chronic hepatitis C so genotype one to six is eight to 16 weeks of panorals so DAA therapy. So, however, so the, all these registration studies exclude HPV infected patients as in terms of service antigen positivity. So, in reality, so HPV and HCV co-infections so frequently occurs, so especially in areas so where HPV infections is endemic. Indeed, the estimated the populations with HPV and HCV co-infections is around 3.2 to 12.8 million um, subjects. And this is of great importance because of from the understandings of previous uh, studies of co-infections, we understand that either infections, uh, co-infections can result in uh, inhibitory activities against either one of them. And therefore the removal of one of them might result in reactivations of the others. Having this in mind, we did a prospective studies initiated in 2015 so when Panoros DAA therapies is being so introduced uh, to our patients. And so our studies include more than 300 subjects and some of them so with the co-infections were shown so to suffer from hepatitis uh, B reactivations uh, with the treatments of hepatitis C 
uh, the due to the administrations of pan oral DAAs. As shown over here, uh, subjects are treated with co-infection, surface antigen positive Chinese with the chronic hepatitis C treated with sulfosylvase-based therapies, which has suffered from the hepatitis due to HB reactivations treated with antigravir. One of the patients also suffers from fulminant hepatic failure and almost died. In our studies, we also uh, examined um, the importance of service engine negative patients uh, with or without uh, or crowd hepatitis B infections, uh, as defined by the positivity of HBV DNA by the nested PCL, or the presence of anti-core positivities. Uh, it has shown that in those patients uh, who are chronic hepatitis C infected, uh, and if they have um, uh, occult uh, chronic hep uh, hepatitis B infections, if they are treated with uh, pan oral DAAs, uh, the risk of HB reactivations is extremely low as compared to those who are service antigen positive. This is pretty reassuring. And our work uh, was um, uh, published in Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatologies, and our group uh, is honored uh, to have uh, our papers to be the most cited articles in this journal uh, in 2017. Together with our works and also reports by others, um, the US FDA illustrates a black box warning for the treatment of chronic hepatitis C patients co-infected with hepatitis B with DAAs. And it is um, mandatory and recommended uh, to have service antigen tested for all patients who are uh, chronic hepatitis C to be treated with DAAs. And these patients need to be monitored very closely or treated with preemptive uh, uh, um, nucleoside analog therapy for hepatitis B infection. So we did a meta-analysis uh, uh, based on the literature search on those patients who are co-infected with chronic hepatitis B and hepatitis C and treated with panoros DAA. So we showed that the poor incidence rates of hepatitis due to HBV reactivations was significantly higher in those patients uh, treated with DAAs as compared to interferon-based therapy. And so, and uh, indeed the time of HB reactivations is also significantly shorter sir, for those patients treated with DAAs as compared sir, to those treated with interferon-based therapy. HB reactivations occurs sir, at around eight weeks sir, with the initiations of pan oral DAAs therapy as compared sir, to 42 weeks for those patients uh, treated with interferon-based therapy. The underlying mechanisms um, and, uh, has recently been shown so, to be related uh, to the hyperactive innate immunity when those patients uh, who are co-infected with hepatitis C in patients with service antigen positive. And with the removals of the hepatitis C virus uh, with the potent uh, direct acting antiviral agents, uh, that um, immunity against hepatitis B uh, replications is also removed, resulting uh, in the reactivations. As demonstrated in this uh, beautiful study uh, published by the Jack Lance groups, uh, which shows that uh, six CL10 and CCL5 and ALT levels uh, has a high predictive values uh, on HPV reactivations. In those patients who are co-infected with hepatitis C and service antigen positive and treated with uh, pan orals uh, direct acting antiviral agents. So the current recommendations from ASLD and ESOs and APASOs all recommend uh, and the, the screening of HPV serologies in all patients uh, who are hep chronic hepatitis C infected that are planned for treatments of DAAs. And preemptive nucleoside analogs is also recommended uh, by the uh, free societies uh, in those patients who have uh, active uh, chronic hepatitis B by ASLD, all patients who are service antigen positive or with occult infections by ESOs, and by APASOs, those patients who have advanced fibrosis, cirrhosis, or previous HCC. In the era of COVID-19 pandemic, um, our reason the clinical practice guidelines for hepatology and liver transplant uh, providers uh, has been published by Hepatology International, uh, uh, based on the work uh, uh, done by the APASO COVID-19 task force. For all patients who are COVID-19, um, uh, uh, we recommend screening for service antigen positive and nucleoside analogs that should be prescribed to prevent HPV reactivations, especially those patients who are going to, 
to be treated with IL-6 monoclonal antibodies or other immunosuppressive therapies such as steroid. Relating to the management, robust data need to be generated from randomized controlled trials. And indeed, uh, over the period of uh, 10 years from 2003 to 2013, preemptive therapies uh, with the use of uh, nucleosinologs uh, in patients who are service antigen positive uh, or even service antigen negative with occult HPV infections uh, treated with uh, cytotoxic chemotherapies uh, for lymphomas uh, or other malignancies has been shown to be the superior to a deferred management protocol. Therefore, based on these RCT studies, nuclear cyanologs is now the highly recommended by all regional liver authoritative societies to be implemented for those patients who undergo intense chemotherapy or immunosuppressive therapy if they are service antigen positive. This uh, concept or the practice of prophylactic use of nucleoside analog therapy for those patients who are service antigen positive and also for those patients who are service antigen negative but with occult infections but placed on the, on the disease modifiers or immunomodulatory uh, immunosuppressive therapies uh, shows to be uh, potent in terms of HPV reactivations uh, and so is supported by a meta-analysis uh, uh, published by POR in the 2016 as shown in these uh, figures. Uh, HPV reactivations uh, in most of the studies was defined as one lock increase of HPV DNA levels uh, and or the emergence of service antigens uh, when the patients are previously service antigen negative. It is clearly shown that uh, prophylactic or preemptive use of nuclear cyanide locks uh, results in a marked reduction uh, of hepatitis due to HPV reactivations and also its clinical consequences uh, and sometimes uh, um, so can result in fulminant hepatic failures or even death. However, fatal hepatitis due to HPV reactivations, despite uh, all the clinical research works which shows how it should be prevented and how it should be managed and who uh, should be screened for service antigens or HPV markers, it still happens. And there is no the, um, uh, indications that there is a reduction of the change of the emissions or the, the clinical um, attentions need to be paid to these patients. Indeed, hepatitis B due to reactivations has been shown to remain unchanged over a period of 1919 to 2014. To this end, we believe that um, uh, from a puzzle point of view, the management of the chronic uh, for patients who are infected with hepatitis B, either being service antigen positive or with occult HPV infections, uh, and so needs uh, to a practical the clinical uh, guidelines uh, to prevent uh, this from further happening. So we need uh, clinical practice guidelines uh, to decide who should be screened and what should be screened in terms of HPV markers, who should be initiated with preemptive nuclear cyanide and who should be monitored and what to do next. To this end, and APASO has set up the consensus working party for HPV reactivations and with a group of more than 20 experts in various areas as a, uh, in a clinical practice as a, who will face patients with hepatitis due to HPV reactivations. And the results of this consensus and so will be presented at APASO 2021 at Bangkok's meeting. The main objective is to the, draw up a, a practical the, a clinical practice guidelines and so that uh, uh, the other the non hepatologists will also be able to utilize with ease. It is a um, usual practice, uh, the, it's a common uh, phenomenon that uh, most of those patients who suffer from hepatitis due to HPV reactivations and who has undergone the immunosuppressive therapies uh, are not seen by the hepatologists. And therefore, we believe that uh, a, clinic, a practical clinical practice guidelines uh, should make it easy to be read by other non-hepatologists such as medical oncologists, hematologists, interventional radiologists, transplant surgeons, rheumatologists, and nephrologists. This is a memorial the webinar um, for the Professor Roger Williams. And I'm really fortunate to have arrived with Roger. In 1996, we climbed up the Great Wall of China 
and initiate our joint ventures to help uh, to develop hepatology in China. We have debates, discussions, and symposiums, and, um, and sometimes uh, after the, the discussions with intense uh, uh, intellectual interactions, uh, this is how Prof will enjoy the sunshines with the ties on and to have a rest. Prof has made tremendous achievements and is well recognized with various awards. And um, it is really my honor to know Prof and sometimes before we jump into the swimming pools uh, to have a further stimulations to be initiated. Last but not least, with the incentive brought to us by Prof. Roger Williams, the journey will continue and we will certainly sail beyond 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Wonderful talk. And then it's a great tribute to the Roger Williams. And uh, Nikolai, uh, how we should do? Because we have some limitation for time. How do you think? Nikolai. Nikolai, you have in to. The, in the interest of time, we should run the closing remarks uh, to make sure that we complete on time. Thank you very much again to Asian Pacific Liver Association for organizing this tribute to Roger Williams and uh, for so many friends from Asia to be part of this uh, event. So I'll pass on to the Apazel Secretariat. Roger Williams was a remarkable person who made a difference to the life of patients and doctors worldwide. He was striving for top results and achievements to the end of his life. His unparalleled legacy will live on, carried further by those who he trained and inspired to bring benefit to patients with liver diseases and to continuing success of hepatology. I would like to invite you all to join me in observing a minute silence in memory of Professor Roger Williams. Thank you. Person, may I speak uh, for a minute? Sure, Shif, go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's a tribute by a puzzle and our leader, uh, Masao, and of course, George. Uh, thank you for making this happen and get the and you can see that about 170 people, this is much more than the ASLD uh, general webinars attain. And this is both the Apostle's contribution as well as, of course, the legendary Roger Williams. And I would like to say that he has been a mentor to many of us and been a teacher of teachers. And also one thing he was very, unique you know in picking up talent and retaining talent and i would like to say that includes roger william uh, includes nikolai rajiv jalan and antonio uh, these were the initial three pillars when the school uh, uh, the uc the the institute of hepatology started and i Therefore, feel it was very appropriate that we picked up Nikolai, and of course, George was his blue-eyed boy, so it was very nice. But me and Masao both 
also would like to contribute on behalf of the steering committee, on behalf of all our presidents, our students, a great tribute. And I was lucky that I was called for the first Ralph Kahn uh, 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 oration by Roger in uh, 2017. So we all pay tributes to him. We learn and I hope his memory will remain uh, for us ever. And with that, and also with an announcement that Apostle School of Hepatology will start from next Tuesday, I will pass on to our chairs and moderators for the day. And both were excellent talks and I have many questions but no time. So to Ed as well as George, a salutations for outstanding uh, talks. Thank you. Thank you, Puzzle. Thank you to all friends from Asia and uh, have a good day, good evening. And I look forward to new meetings which will be in person in future. Thank you very much, everybody. Good Thank luck. You. Thank yeah. you very much.